delighted to come tonight to talk to you about cancer services. And cancer services consists of clinical hematology, oncology, um, so that's chemotherapy, radiotherapy, palliative care, and also the cancer pathways. So just a little bit of background um, to put this in context. One in three people in the UK will get cancer at some point during their lifetime. And the very good news about that is more people are doing far, far better with cancer than ever before and living for much longer. And I'm delighted to say that many, many people are now cured of their cancer. And those that aren't cured are often living for a long, long time with cancer as a chronic illness and we are able to give them many more treatments. However, one in four people will die from cancer, um, and therefore we need to think about cancer services from diagnosis, and we know that the faster we make the diagnosis and the earlier during the illness, the better people will do. But make sure that we're supporting them throughout their illness, and particularly when that we are unable to cure it. So cancer, actually, the, the big four, as they're called, make up more than half of the cancer diagnoses in this country. And as you can see, the big four are breast, lung, prostate, and bowel cancer. And I'll come on to talk a little bit more about what we are doing to try and improve the services for people with those cancers. So we um, are very involved in preventative work for cancers, um, screening, diagnosis and treatment and last year we had over 10,000 people referred into our hospitals with a suspected cancer diagnosis and we made over a thousand diagnoses of cancer and then decided on treatment and treated those people appropriately. So you may have heard of um, things called cancer targets and generally targets aren't thought to be great things, but I have to say in cancer, I think we all agree that they are actually quite a good thing. And this is about trying to get people with suspected cancer seen as quickly as possible in our hospitals, and then diagnosis and treatment started as quickly as possible. So this is a very busy slide, but actually, if you go to your GP and they suspect cancer, they will refer you into the hospital on something called a two-week rule, which is just as it says on the tin, to be seen within two weeks. And we do our absolute best to do that because we know if you're told you may have cancer, that is very, very worrying. And people want to be seen. They want to go to the next steps to either disprove it, hopefully, or make that diagnosis as quickly as possible. We then um, go through all the diagnostic phase, which may be scans, maybe possibly operations, to find what it is, and then make a decision to treat, and then start treatment within 62 days from being referred into the hospital. Now, if you are suspecting you have cancer, that probably feels a very, very long time. That's two months but actually to attend a number of appointments, have a number of investigations, it, it actually can feel like we're trying to get people into appointments and through the system very, very quickly. And we know that people sometimes struggle with that and they may have plans and they may have big holidays booked, but actually we cannot um, stop the clock for any of that. So we have to fit our appointments around holidays and all sorts of things. So that is what the cancer targets are about. And I'm pleased to say that with a lot of hard work from patients, their families, our clinicians, our administrative staff, we actually meet all the cancer targets. Um, we met them all for last year. We struggle because actually there are more and more um, tests that we can do to really find out exactly what is the best treatment for people. And these things take longer and longer to do. So it is a challenge, and I'm aware that people often feel that they're being encouraged to come to appointment after appointment very, very quickly, um, and that can feel quite difficult. But the reason we're doing it is we know the sooner we're able to start treatment, the better, and actually people want to get going with their treatment. 
So the areas of cancer services, as I mentioned, clinical haematology. So this is care of people with blood cancers like um, leukemia, lymphoma, but also they look after people with non-cancers like anemias. Um, and actually our haematology service um, is one of the first services to integrate across all of our hospital sites. And they um, provide clinical service as well as being involved in the laboratory. And if a blood test comes in, which is abnormal, then it's some of our consultants who will look at the slide of that blood to really try and work out what is going on. So we provide outpatient services in um, Winchester, Basingstoke, Andover and Alton. And we have an inpatient ward in Basingstoke, that's Wessex Ward. We have a big multidisciplinary team, doctors, specialists, nurses, microbiologists, and many different people coming together to provide the best possible care that we can. And our consultants are available 24 seven, so sometimes GPs call them up to ask how should they best manage things. So actually they may be involved without even seeing patients to try and keep people out of hospitals if at all possible. So we're very, very keen on recruiting to research trials and in haematology they do a lot of that, trying to find the very best treatments for people. And for the size of our hospital, it's quite unique that we're recruiting as many people into trials. And we know for patients and their families, they like to feel part of that, that they're providing some benefit for people in the future as to whether these treatments work. They do a lot of training as well, and people like to come to our service to see um, you know, how we provide a service across so many different hospitals. And what I can also say is it's getting much, much busier. So historically, if you had an acute leukemia, became very, very sick very quickly, you, if you lived in the Winchester or Andover area, you'd be referred down to Southampton. Nowadays, you have the option to stay with the team and be treated as an inpatient in Basingstoke or indeed go to Southampton if that's what you want. But there is an option to stay with the team that you've got to know. And most people are opting to do that. And they will see the same consultants they might have seen when they were first see, seen in outpatients, which is much, much better continuity. Oncology is... Um, <coughs> The, the care of people with solid tumours, so lung cancer, bowel cancer, prostate cancer. And historically we have um, provided outpatient assessments, and as you write, they referred people down for radiotherapy in Southampton and Guildford. But we have provided chemotherapy, and we continue to do so. And we provide that on the Basing unit in um, Basingstoke, and Nick Jonas unit in Winchester, and our mobile chemotherapy unit that Mary mentioned, and I'll show you a few pictures in a minute. So we provide predominantly outpatient care, and it's fantastic these days, very different from five, ten years ago, when a lot of chemotherapy required people to come into hospital and stay for a number of days, or dare I say weeks, to have their chemotherapy. But most chemotherapy for solid tumours is now given as an outpatient and indeed we can give it on our mobile chemotherapy unit. So we do have what we call an acute oncology service. So our oncologists will see people if they have come into hospital with perhaps complications of their treatment or their cancer, but predominantly people under the care of the oncology team are at home, where I think they mostly want to be. So again, we're getting busier and busier. So there was about a 20% increase in the chemotherapy that we gave last year. And um, the reason for that is that more people are being diagnosed with cancer, but there are a lot more treatments we can give. So previously in breast cancer, for example, we may give first line, <coughs> second line chemotherapy, very occasionally third line. Now people are very, very frequently having fifth, sixth, seventh line treatments and we're able to get more and more targeted treatments. So there are many, many more things that we can do. 
We also provide 24-7 um, um, telephone advice to people having chemotherapy and we know that this is critically important. So if you develop a problem on chemotherapy, we have always told people how dangerous chemotherapy can be and people are very, very frightened. Should they, do they need to come to the hospital? So actually, um, we're developing this, this advice line to make sure that all of our patients across the trust have access to telephone advice about their chemotherapy treatments at all times. Again, we, re we recruit to trials to make, making sure always that if there are trials available, our patients get the option to go into them. So some people decide they don't want to, that is absolutely fine. But as I said, a lot of people want to feel they're doing some good for people coming um, along later. Our oncology service is also supported by a counselling team, clinical psychologists, to make sure that we're thinking about supporting all aspects of the patient and their families. And I'll come on and talk about that a little bit more. So here is our mobile chemotherapy unit, and I don't know if you've seen it outside um, the hospital. It's there on a Wednesday. Um, it goes to Eastley on a Tuesday. And we've just recruited a new driver. We've had a gap in a regular driver. We just recruited this week, and we will be going out to Tadley and Alton, and probably um, out slightly further north in January. So this is Charlotte and Julie, and they run the mobile chemotherapy unit. And patients can use that who are normally treated or see their consultants in Winchester or Basingstoke. And actually, certainly I know particularly, it's been really, really popular in Andover. So we treat between 15 and 20 patients a day when we come up to Andover. Um, so it, it is really, really appreciated by people not having to travel to Winchester. Um, interestingly, people now drop in to see the nurses to just ask a quick question because they know they'll be there every Wednesday. So um, this is what it, it looks like inside. There are four chairs, so four people can be treated at any time. Um, it's a little bit, so I'm right in the way, a little bit squashed but actually people have got to know each other and they often ask to be treated at the same time. This is our Jane, who was our driver, who, who had to leave, but she uh, is just sort of um, posing there for a picture to show what it's like. And actually we're very, very lucky because this mobile chemotherapy unit was supplied by the charity Hope for Tomorrow. And their, um, the charity is about trying to provide chemotherapy closer to home. So they provided the unit, which um, is extremely expensive, and they maintain it for us. So we staff it, um, and I know that um, they're very, very involved in making sure the service is continually developed, and we're very, very grateful to them for that. So the new thing for our trust is the provision of radiotherapy. And as Mary said, we are going to um, open our interim radiotherapy unit in April. Uh, this is an artist's impression of what it will look like. And the big, big thing about this is to um, reduce the need to travel. So as I mentioned, um, and the lady in the audience mentioned, from um, most of Hampshire, people have to travel for radiotherapy currently to Southampton, to Guildford, or to Portsmouth. And actually there's this <coughs> big hole in the middle of radiotherapy units, which is North Mid Hampshire. And there's been a um, national drive to increase the use of radiotherapy. So techniques have got better and better, mm -hmm. and we can deliver the treatment with fewer and fewer side effects and deliver fantastic results, but people at the moment having to travel a long distance, wait a long time for their treatment. And so there is a need for more machines. And the decision amongst the um, cancer network was that these machines should be provided in North Hampshire to reduce the journeys for people. So if, you're ha if you have breast cancer and you're having uh, radiotherapy, perhaps after your surgery, you would have to travel <coughs> daily for six weeks for radiotherapy. The actual treatment may take three minutes, 
but the travelling, the parking in Southampton, if anyone's ever been to Southampton and tried to park, um, and then getting back can actually mean that it's at least a half a day, if not a day. Um, so this will make a dramatic difference. Um, so it is nearly built, I'm pleased to say. So um, this is the bunker being built, and um, it's this, the walls are this thick, and this is where the radiotherapy machine goes in. Um, so it's all very exciting to look, lots and lots of photos of it going up. But I'm pleased to say this is what it looks like today. So I've been over there with the phone and we've taken some photos. So it's nearly there. This is the entrance. Um, this is inside the waiting area. This is one of the garden areas. So actually it's a light building, um, which will be pleasant to wait. Um, hopefully you won't be waiting very long, but if you are, there'll be nice areas to wait. Um, and this is into the bunker. So you saw the bunker being built and this is what it looks like now. So there's a maze you walk through and the radiotherapy machine will be arriving on the 7th of December. So that's very exciting. <laughs> and then it takes a ridiculous amount of time um, to commission the machine. First of all, it takes six to eight weeks to build it to rise in a number of pieces, and then to make sure it's safe for the delivery of treatment will take us until mid-April. So um, there are all sorts of tests by all sorts of different people, and but when it's ready, um, our first we envisage our first patients being treated on the machine in mid-April. So this is all very exciting, and this is phase one. Now just what we are currently doing um, I'm a palliative care consultant, so I have to tell you about our palliative care service. And we provide um, palliative care across all our hospitals um, and also to the community of North and Mid Hampshire, as well as in Cancer Bretnock Hospice. And we see patients with any life limiting illness, so cancer or non cancer. And we provide a six days a week service with 24 7 access to consultant advice. And again, we've got a big team of people to do that. So there are consultants, specialist nurses, occupational therapists trying to keep people as mobile as possible. Um, there's physiotherapists, dieticians, counsellors, social worker. And the aim of the palliative care service is to keep people feeling as well as possible. So control symptoms, provide them with support, often so they're able to manage some of the treatments that they need to have but mostly to keep them, as I say, with the best quality of life possible. And we also try to teach other healthcare professionals to make sure that everybody is able to provide the best pain relief, the best control of other symptoms, identify problems that may be happening. So we teach GPs, district nurses, nursing home staff, try and where possible to keep people at home if that's where they want to be. And one of the parts of our palliative care service, as I mentioned, is Cancer Bretonal Hospice here in Andover. Um, and as I'm sure most of you know, it has an inpatient unit um, with six beds, which is bursting at the seams at the moment. Um, the average length of stay is 10 days. Um, we have about um, an 88% occupancy rate. So with six beds, we are able to get people in as quickly as possible when they need to come to the hospice. And they may come in because they have problems with different symptoms like pain, sickness. They may come from hospital, from home. Um, some people come in for rehabilitation after operations or radiotherapy. And some people come at the end of their lives when they're dying and actually they don't want to die at home or in the hospital and they want to be in the hospice. And actually, as is the, about the national average, we discharge over half the people who come in. So there is a myth that everybody who comes into a hospice will die there, but actually over half of the people will go home. And we have a um, hospice at home service. I was about to say it's new. It's actually been launched just over a year ago. Um, and this is cared in the last year for 58 patients which who were referred in the last thought to be in their last two weeks of life and actually achieved being able to care for them at home if that's where they wanted to be and we know the reason people go into the hospice 
or go into hospital right at the end of their lives is often because they don't feel well enough supported at home and that's particularly a problem overnight because there isn't a district nursing service anywhere in Hampshire overnight and our hospice at home nurses are on call so if there is a problem if somebody has pain and they need an injection our nurse will go to their house and administer that and that knowledge that someone's there to do that means that actually 100% of these patients were able to die where they wanted to so someone wanted to come into the hospice and we were able to keep them at home until there was a bed available and others wanted to stay at home. And then uh, we have the day hospice and Susan Turner who runs that is here today. <laughs> That's great. And she um, runs the day hospice three times a week and that again keeps people able to manage at home, gives their relatives a bit of a rest, gives them a bit of respite. And actually, um, Susan, who's a physio, keeps them as mobile as possible. We have other therapists working with them there. And they sometimes see the consultant as well. Susan organises me to review them. So that is our palliative care service. We also um, are aware that just over half of the people who die in the whole of the Hampshire Hospital's catchment area die in our hospitals. And we do a lot of work to make sure that the care that they receive in our hospitals is as good as possible. And that is often supported by the palliative care team, but also through good education of our nurses and our doctors. So I was just going to move on now to the future vision for cancer care. And Mary sort of told you a little bit about that, and I, I suspect many of you have heard about it, that we want to build a cancer centre that will improve the experience of thousands of local people with cancer. So we want to provide comprehensive cancer care, so radiotherapy, palliative care, care and supportive care for people all under one roof. So we acknowledge that a lot of these things you can get now, but you have to go to a number of different places to access them. And actually when you're having a lot of cancer treatments, you often don't feel like doing that. And we know that some of the supportive care, so accessing information, advice around health and well-being, people aren't able to access easily enough. We want to empower people to keep them feeling as well as possible. So we want to do this in a building that doesn't feel like a hospital, that actually feels like somewhere where you feel welcomed and safe, which humanises, if you like, the hospital environment. So it feels more normal. When you come in to see an oncologist for the first time, it's incredibly scary. What are they going to tell me? You may well have been told that you've got the cancer diagnosis, but you'll have a thousand questions to ask about that. And actually, it's very, very daunting. So we want to make that process as easy as possible for people. Making sure we provide privacy, dignity, but also distraction and a sense of uplifting where possible. When you're having chemotherapy treatment, unfortunately, there's quite often a need to wait. So you may have had a blood test, you're waiting for the results to then have the treatment. There's a lot of hanging about, which can feel very, very frustrating and very boring if actually you're just in a waiting area. So we want to make sure that we provide areas where actually people feel looked after, cared for, and that there are cafes and things like that, things people can do when they're just waiting. So we've mentioned the um, interim radiotherapy unit, I'm right in the way, sorry, um, which will have the radiotherapy machine and a planning CT scanner, you just have to press it a lot of times. And the new cancer centre will actually be built, we hope, in a couple of years, and what we will do is move our radiotherapy machine from the interim radiotherapy unit into the cancer centre. And you have to press it quite a lot more times. So our cancer centre will provide um, chemotherapy, radiotherapy and all the supportive care treatments. And a lot of parking. Because one of the things we hear from people is the difficulty in parking. Makes these journeys, these treatments a lot, lot more difficult. So we've run a design competition um, for a design team partner to, de to design this building. 
and we had the most amazing interest. So 130 teams from all over the world expressed interest in working with us. This is a novel idea for a trust of our size to develop a brand new cancer treatment center. Now, people do have radiotherapy, chemotherapy together, but usually the supportive care element is in something separate. So it may be called a Maggie's Center or a Macmillan Center, at the Macmillan Centre you have in Southampton, but we want to bring it all together. So you don't have to make a conscious decision to go to the Macmillan Centre because you're going to find some information out. Actually, it's just all together and very, very easy to access. So we've appointed an architect team, and that's BDP, and I'll show you some of their designs. So they understood what we wanted. We wanted a wow building that actually made people feel welcomed and supported. And actually, you may say, is that wow? Well, to me, it's quite wow. But what they acknowledged was the most important thing was inside of this building. Because actually, that's where pe patients and their families are spending the most of their time. So the wow is inside. And there's, this is a chemotherapy area where you have access to look outside. Because actually, some of the chemotherapy treatments we give take eight hours. So there's a lot of sitting around. But actually, this is very flexible. You can make it very private. You can open it out. If you've got people with you, there's a bit more space. If you just want to pretend you're not there and work on your computer, that can be achieved as well. So it's not a hospital with corridors. This is very, very different. It doesn't feel like a hospital. And that is the aim of our building. And that's what we're just starting now to work with the architects to design. And so a lot of this, the supportive care element and this wow side of the building, actually we can't afford as the NHS to fund this. So what we are doing is um, we've launched a charity called the Art Cancer Centre Charity to help us raise money for this additional aspect of the treatment. So the supportive care, which the NHS currently can't provide, and the enhanced building. And these are the details about the Cancer Centre Charity. And I also want to mention that the Medical Fund and RADCAN have worked incredibly hard to raise money through the Pinpoint Appeal to donate a CT scanner. And they're almost at their target. And the CT scanner will be going into our interim unit. So this is three charities working together um, to make sure that we're providing the very best treatment for our patients. And if you're interested in helping, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So thank you very much.